We hope this message from Word of Life Church and Pastor Brian Zahn is a blessing to you. If you'd like to help support these Word of Life podcasts, please go to the Contributions tab at wolc.com. Thank you. There's this uh, myth out there that Canadians are the nicest people in the world. But I was telling Brian, I, I get treated so well when I come to the United States, like better than anywhere in the world, treated like a prince. And I, uh, this weekend is just another confirmation of that. I, I'm so glad that you invited me. Uh, tonight, I want to share what really, uh, through no fault of my own, has become my life message. And it's to do with hearing God. Uh, my job is not to, not to come teach you how to hear God, but to convince you how well you already hear Him. And to explain why it is that you hear Him so well. And, in, and, and maybe to indict you as excellent God hearers that just need to let it count a bit more. I'm, I'm here to water the seed um, of your faith. Uh, Just with a few scriptures, a a little exercise or two, and maybe a a few stories. Uh, Why don't we start with the Bible? In Jeremiah chapter 31 to 33, we have what's called the New Covenant. We've just been celebrating, you know, Passion Week, the uh, Good Friday, Easter Sunday, and then what flows after that into Pentecost. And Jeremiah 31 to 33 is a prophecy by the prophet Jeremiah of that new covenant. When Jesus raised the cup on Good Friday, or or I guess it was Thursday, (laughs) he raised the cup at the last time. He says, this is the cup of the new covenant. It triggers a memory. Oh yes, that which uh, Jeremiah spoke about. This is Jeremiah 31 to 33, uh, and, and he's, he's just activating this. And he's like, starting now. Starting now, what Jeremiah prophesied is about to unfold. I am activating it. And what's in Jeremiah 31 to 33 is the fine print of our contract. This uter- unilateral covenant that God's made with us is very, very exciting because Uh, There's a lot of promises in here that are guaranteed by his blood. I mean guaranteed by his blood. And we ought to see what's in those chapters because some of the promises are never repeated in the New Testament. The New Testament authors assumed you would check for yourself. Give you an example. You might not know about this. Under the New Covenant... Old and young will dance together. It's never never repeated in the New Testament, but it's in the New Covenant. What I want to do is I want to begin tonight with some promises about God's willingness and his generosity to speak to you. And I could pick these from all over the Bible, but I'm going to restrict myself to the guarantees of his blood. I won't give you any promises except those which are in the new covenant that he raised and said, when I die, it's for forgiveness of sins, but just as much, just as guaranteed, and I want you to expect it just as thoroughly that I will speak to you. It's in the same covenant. So in in, uh, Jeremiah, we'll look at just a couple of uh, passages there. I think I'll start with... Chapter 33, verse 1 to 3. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Pause. What's that like? When the word of the Lord comes to someone, how does it come to you? And maybe you can reflect on some of the ways the word of the Lord has come. Often it will come as God thoughts. I don't know that Jeremiah heard the word of the Lord out loud with his physical ears that day. But he's sitting in this, in this courtyard and this word comes to him. And whether it's, it sounds like God thoughts, whether it sounds like words, whether it's in pictures. Uh, he can come on many frequencies. But in any case, the word of the late Lord came to uh, Jeremiah. And, and verse 2 says this. Thus says the Lord who made the earth. 
The Lord who formed it to establish it. The Lord is his name. What's he doing? He's being very repetitive and redundant, but why? I believe he's swearing on his own name three times. God is making an oath as part of this new covenant. He says, I will, I will swear an oath on my own name and I cannot lie. And I'm going to need to do that, not only so that you'll be convinced that this is a promise, but because I know what will happen. Every time you pray, the enemy will challenge this promise. It's the very first promise the enemy challenged. Did God really say? And he comes to, uh, to me in prayer. The enemy comes to me in prayer. And, and as I'm trying to listen to God and the, the Lord begins to speak to me, the enemy says again and again and again, you're just making that up. You just want to hear that. Oh, you, that's probably your imagination. And how do you know anyway? It could be God, could be you, and you can't know. And God knows this will happen, so he swears on his name three times. And if we were to be Trinitarian about it, he says, look it, I'm going to swear in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit that under the new covenant, this is what you get as surely as you get forgiveness of sins. Verse 3, call on me and I'll answer you. Call on me and what will happen? He'll answer us. Now, when I was a, a, a good conservative evangelical Baptist growing up who did not believe God speaks today, what we meant by that is, if you leave a, a message on God's answering machine and then just kind of stand back and watch your life, you will begin to see that you get what you want. Except that's not what he's saying. He's saying, if you call on me, someone will pick up and you'll get a live voice. Yeah. If you call on me, I'll answer you. And I will tell you, talk to you, speak to you, great and awesome or hidden or surprising things that you didn't even know. The expectancy that he's hoping to impart to us is that when I go to prayer, it will be a conversation, it will be a dialogue, it will be an interaction. And of course, it's really troubling, I, I imagine, to the Lord when I pick up the phone and call him in prayer and I say, our Father art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Yada, 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 amen, click. And he's like, wait a minute. I kind of had some things to say. I kind of had some blessings to share. And it, he hung up again. We called that a personal relationship. What's personal about that? What's relational about it? Under the new covenant, um, I think if I were to apply this verse and, and, and exhort you to apply it, it would sound like this. When you pray, give God a turn. And, uh, and, and spend some time as you pray listening and expect the word of the Lord to come because he promised. Because he promised. Now let's just check, what, now who gets this? Um, Jeremiah chapter 31, this is the beginning of that covenant. And I'll just pick up in a part of it. Verse 33, Jeremiah 31 to 30, or verse 33. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. This is the new covenant. I will put my law within them. Inside of them. And I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they will be my people. Now, now get a load of verse 34. I'm glad I didn't say this. God did through Jeremiah. <laughs> no longer shall they teach one another. Or say to each other, know the Lord. For they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. And I'll forgive their iniquity. I'll remember their sin no more. Uh, this is fascinating to me. He, he's actually saying that uh, under, perhaps under the old covenant, you heard through a priest, you heard through a prophet, you heard through the scrolls, and it's, it was all mediated. And, and now he comes along and he says, oh no, everyone's getting a direct line. That's often a criticism I hear. Oh, what are you saying? You get a direct line to God? Yes. 
That's what it's saying. You all, you all get to hear me for yourself. You all, from the least to the greatest. Now, I, I come from an awesome little church called Fresh Wind. And we know about the least. The four pillars of our church are people with disabilities, children, prodigal addicts in recovery coming home, and the poor. We've seen the least in terms of the littlest. We've seen the least in terms of the most disabled beyond even uh, you know, conscious awareness of what's happening around them. We see the least in those who, who, who are the least mature and, and, in fact, the most messed up, the least moral, and even you, you know, the, poor, the, the least wealthy. On every level, level we, we, we have come under the mentorship of the least, and here's the consistent message we see in their testimonies. God speaks to them yeah. from day one. From day one, the very first thing we do when we lead someone to the Lord is, well, we lead them to the Lord. Sandra, this is Jesus. Jesus, this is Sandra. I'm going to call on Jesus and he's going to answer us because you're a sheep now and my sheep hear my voice. So I will ask Jesus a question and he will speak to your heart. You tell me what he's saying because the Bible says if we call on him, what will happen? Let's do some, just a little memorization thing. So uh, let, let's say the verse together just so we really get it. Um, if you call on me, I will answer you. Okay, let's say it together. If you call on me, I will answer you. No, really. <laughs> now when, in Wales, they taught me this. When I say, no, really, I, I'd like you to say, yes, Really? Just for fun, I know it's cheesy, but this will help us remember. When you call on me, no, really. What if we began to expect that in a very real way? That when, when I call on him, I will get an answer. That that's the default mode, and I should be surprised at the silence if there is any. And so the least of these have shown us this from day one because I found five conditions for hearing God in the Bible. Did you not? Five conditions. Number one, the incarnation. Number two, the crucifixion. Number three, the resurrection. Number four, Christ's ascension to the throne of God. And number five, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Have you met those conditions? (laughs) No, he did. A long time ago. Every, every one of the conditions is fulfilled in the new covenant. It has been done so that from the very first day and probably before that of your faith journey, God has been speaking to you. It's just a matter of tuning in. So uh, let's just check one other passage here. Uh, John 16. Again, this is the Thursday night, the, night, the, the Last Supper, the Last Supper. And I want to put your name in it. I think that would be fun. Uh, I found out when I was a little kid that if Jesus is speaking to his disciples a word of promise, I can put my name in it. For God so loved Bradley that he gave his only son that if Bradley would believe in him, Bradley doesn't need to perish. Bradley gets to have eternal life. Well, John 16, from 14 to 16 is like that. And again, this is the new covenant. All that what you see in John 14 to 16 is like Jeremiah in that way. These are the promises that are activated, uh, especially on on the day of Pentecost. Jesus says, because of what I'm about to do, I'm going to set things rolling and John 16 will be true. Who needs encouragement tonight? Anyone need encouragement? Okay, that lady there. What's your name? Yeah, you. Marilyn. Marilyn. Let's put Marilyn's name in. John 16, verse 12. Oh, Marilyn, I still have many more things to say to you. You could have memorized every sermon Jesus preached, every teach he gave, every conversation he had around the dinner table, every late night talk around the campfire. You could have memorized all four gospels and he would still say to you, there is so much more I have to say to you, Marilyn. It's like bursting out of me, but... You can't bear it right now. Too bad. Oh, but wait. Jesus 
has an idea about this dilemma when the spirit of truth comes. When did that happen? Any Pentecostals in the room? Hint, hint. (laughs) When the spirit of truth comes, the primary reason the spirit of truth comes is to solve Jesus' dilemma about having so much more to say to you. It's not just an outpouring of prophecy and visions and it's prophecies of Jesus, visions of Jesus, the voice of God being poured out on, how does that verse go? I will trickle out my spirit on select flesh? No. Think Niagara Falls. I will pour out my spirit in a way that will get anyone with skin wet. And when the spirit of truth comes, he, this is a strong statement, he will guide Marilyn into all truth. Or at least her community. It means something. Guide you into all truth. That's a very, very strong statement. For the Holy Spirit will not speak on his own, but he will speak whatever he hears. What do do you mean, whatever the Holy Spirit hears? Who's the Holy Spirit listening to? Well, the Father and the Son talking about Marilyn. And it might look like this. Oh, Son, have you thought about Marilyn lately? And Jesus is like, are you kidding? I can't get her off my mind. And the father's like, I know what you mean. I'm absolutely obsessing about her. I have all these thoughts. Like they outnumber the sands on the seashore. And I'm multitasking them all the time. And Jesus is like, I know. And day and night I'm at your throne talking about her, aren't I? And it's like the father's like, I know. And I never get tired of it because I want to bless her. That that seashore of sand full of thoughts for her, it's just running out of me. And and I want to bless her destiny. I want to bless her life. I want to give her favor. I want to give her flavor of the gospel all around her. I want to give her more authority. I want to increase her faith. I want to make her a walking manifestation of love and a portable environment of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is like, oh yeah, bring it, Daddy. And then Jesus says, "Uh, can I have a turn, Father? And the Father's like, of course, I love your voice. And Jesus said, well, I love my own voice. Because it's so full of hope and, and life. And, I, and in fact, Father, how about never even mind her destiny? Let's talk about today. I'm going to reach out to her. I'm going to wink at her. My eyes will twinkle at her. I'm going to borrow somebody's mouth to bless her and encourage her. I hope she notices it's me. In fact, there'll be little flowers that no one else will see before they wither before her, before she sees them or after, because they're just a gift. In fact, maybe she'll see a bug and know that I care about the little things. And the father's like, I'm getting verklempt. <laughs> Meanwhile, what's the Holy Spirit doing? He's eavesdropping heaven. And then he comes to me, do you know what they're saying behind your back? This is unbelievable. Can I share some of it with you? And and Marilyn's like, oh, please, just would you speak to me? It's like, are you kidding? I'm going to tell you whatever I hear. Does this sound like a stingy God? Does it sound like you're going to have to fast and pray for 40 days and twist his arm? Does it seem like you're going to have to pray harder and like, oh, God, come on, just speak to me. It's like, you could get a laxative for that. <laughs> no, just open up your heart and let the, think of it as this. Open your mouth and drink Niagara Falls as it come down. It's like, would you speak to me? Ah, boom. Of course I would. Oh, it gets worse. (laughs) Be very clear. I did not say this. This is Jesus. Red letters means it's true. (laughs) He will declare to you what's coming. Why do people go to psychics and play with Ouija boards and, and, uh, you know, read their horoscope? We want to know what's coming. And when we go down that path, when we go to that table, we get bound up in chains called fear of the future. But it w- what if you just came to him and said, hey, Lord, what's coming? Under the new covenant, you made this promise. And I'm not demanding. I'm just saying. I'm open. Will you tell me what I need to know? Just tell me what I need to know. And then tell me why I need to know it. I shared with the staff today, we had a time um, in our church, we went through 35 major tragedies over the course of months. Before that happened, the week before it started, our leadership team 
came together, and then we brought our whole church together to listen. And we prayed this, Lord, what's coming? And we began to listen, and we began to hear a theme, and it was, <laughs> there is a hurricane coming. There is an earthquake coming. There is trials and tribulations coming, and it's going to be nasty. We're like, why would you tell us this? And the Lord said, very clearly, I'm telling you so that, A, you don't think you did something wrong and are being punished, and B, so you don't think I've left you. That's not what's happening. Gather together and find out how to love each other in the mighty fortress, which is our God. So we didn't have to introspect about what did we do wrong, you know? Where is God? We, we, were able, we were able to make it through, sort of, knowing he is with us and for us. We needed to know what was coming. And when you need to know, if you'll listen, he'll tell you. I didn't say it. Jesus said it. Well, Marilyn, why is the Holy Spirit allowed to tell you whatever he's hearing? Why is that legal? Like, won't that go to your head or something? Here's what Jesus says. It is spiritually legal to share whatever I hear from the Father and the Son about Marilyn because when he does that, it will glorify Jesus. Verse 14, he will glorify me. You will, he will glorify me because he, the Holy Spirit, will take what is mine, what belongs to Jesus, and make it known to Marilyn. Why does that glorify the, 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 you know, the Lord? Why, why would that glorify him? Well, it's because Marilyn's listening, and it was even happening tonight, and you're thinking, if he's really like that, I'll follow him forever. If, he, if he's as kind as what I'm hearing, I love him. He's got my heart. Yeah. If, he's, if he's so gracious and so generous with his voice and with his love, I'm in all the way. Does that make sense? Okay. And then... He says, uh, and all the Father, in case you didn't get it, all the Father has belongs to Jesus. For this reason, I said, the Holy Spirit will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is under the new covenant. This is the promise that comes with the death and resurrection, ascension and, and, and outpouring. Uh, let's, just let's review the verbs here and tell me if God speaks Say to you, guide you, speak, speak, declare, declare, declare. That's a lot of verbs about talking in four verses. And they're all for Marilyn. And if you want, you can have them too. Well, what we did, I, I, I think I should just uh, share a story about what this looks like for us now. We began to believe as a church that if Jesus is with us all the time, let me just check this with you. True or false, Jesus is with you all the time. Yeah. Matthew 28, right? Always. I will never, 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 sixfold negative in Hebrews, leave you or forsake you. He's, you're stuck with him. He's not leaving, okay? So if that's true... Uh, second, he's your very best friend. True or false? You know? He's the perfect parent who, who loves you with an everlasting love. Okay? Um, so, so that's true. And then, what will happen if you call on him? We would expect an answer. Of course he would, right? If he's really here at my right hand so I will not be shaken. If he's really here, thank you for being here. And we practice his presence by acknowledging this is true. Yes, he's in my heart. But think of it, just for now, think of the, the Acts chapter 2. I saw the Lord always before my face. Because he's at my right hand, I'll not be shaken. And he loves me so much that when I call on him, he answers me. This is like an ongoing living interaction with a real person. Well, I started thinking, if, if that's true, let's live it. And let's set it up. In fact, I could set up meetings with anybody. You want to meet Jesus? Okay, Thursday, 1 o'clock. You're going to meet Jesus because he's with me all the time. And when I call on him, he answers. And he answers not just me. He answers the least of these. 
So we will get together with people and we, we'll, we'll give a simple list of questions. We'll say this. If you could meet Jesus anywhere, where would you meet him? Just think about a place in your heart. And they'll say, oh yeah, I'd meet him on a beach. Or I'd meet him on a mountaintop. Or I'd meet him on a path. Or I'd meet him right here. Or I'd meet him in my favorite easy chair. I'd meet him in my bedroom. I'd meet him in my office. I'd meet him in my... And, and people, people know where they'd like to meet him. Oh, I, I just see like he's, there's a tree in a big field and I'm under the tree with him. And they're like, okay, good. Well, what they're doing is they're describing a place in their heart where they can interact with, with him. And then we ask this, how does he come to you there? And, uh, and we'll hear he comes as a shepherd, he comes as a friend, he comes as an older caring mentor, he comes as a, you know, father, he comes as a, however they need him to come, Jesus will come. And then we ask, uh, when, when you meet him there, what's the, what expression do you see in his face? And we hear he's kind, he's loving, he knows, he cares. And often people will just begin weeping. I didn't know he was this kind. I always thought he was like a judge. I thought he was harsh. I thought he was, I can't believe what I'm seeing. And they open their, the eyes of their heart to look in his eyes. I say, what are his eyes saying to you? He loves me. He accepts me. He knows exactly what I'm like and he cares anyway, <laughs> you know? And then I'll ask, what's the very first thing he says to you? And often it's two or three words that begin a healing process in their life. Now when I say them, here's one example of them. We have a team of ladies who goes into a recovery house once a month and sets up a meeting with Jesus with every woman in the recovery house who've never darkened the door of a church. Some have come off the street as prostitutes. Some of them are just in the first week out of their addiction to crystal meth or crack or heroin. We have yet to meet a woman in that home who cannot both hear and see, see Jesus within five minutes. Of course he would do that for them. Yeah. Of course he would do that. So when we say, that's Jesus, how do you like him so far? Oh. Would you like him to wash away all your sins? Yes. Would you like him to be your best friend forever? Of course. Okay, I think you just became a Christian. <laughs> Day one, the least of these, right? So I want to close with a specific story. I was in a conference, maybe about this size, and, and we just did this exercise I've just shared with you. And maybe as I'm sharing it, you can go along, right? Do it yourself. And, and, and I said, uh, think about the, this, the place where you would meet the Lord how he comes to you and what's the first thing he says. And this, this woman in the third row, she starts like really weeping over there. And, I mean, she was a mess. And, and, and I'm thinking, okay, uh, it's getting disruptive. I'll just kind of shut her down a little bit. Mighty man of God, compassionate, loving. <laughs> shut her down. No, what I said was, you know, so what's happening in your heart there? She said, I, I'm running along a beach. This is never, she goes, I've never had this before. But in my, in my mind, I'm running along a beach, and he's right beside me running with me. I'm like, that's awesome. And I said, what's the first thing he says to you? You belong to me. And then she starts crying. And I, I said, well, I'm going to dismiss us in about 10 minutes for lunch. You just stay there with him. When you're having an interaction with Jesus, if you have to choose between him and me, Stay with him. So I kind of wound down the meeting, and then afterwards I went over to her. I'm like, that was really awesome. Hey, you got to meet Jesus for the first time. You got to look in his face. You got to hear his voice. She goes, oh, you don't understand. Three months ago, I was a Satanist. And I, I, she said, I was so powerless that I was grasping for anything. It's not a Satanist strutting around being evil. She's a broken woman. Uh, who is legally blind, couldn't see more than five feet in front of her. Her uh, and uh, just lots of problems, lots of problems. You all get into it in a minute. But she she said, "I became a Christian because I was so desperate." A guy from the vineyard came and he gave me a prophetic word. He said, "The Lord wants you to know this. He has a message for you. God loves you." And she said, "I couldn't get it out of my heart. It was really a prophetic word." I commission all of you to go prophesy that this week. And uh, she couldn't, she, she actually left the town she was in to try to get away from it. 
couldn't, became a Christian. Like she found a, another pastor. How do you become a Christian? He gave her like the sinner's prayer. She says the sinner's prayer. But the problem was the enemy would come to her and said, you belong to me. Remember the rituals you did. Remember the whatever she did, probably killing cats or something. You belong to me. Remember the vows you made? You belong to me. And she couldn't get past this. Now she's running on a beach with Jesus and he's looking her in the eyes in a way she knows he can't lie. And he says, you belong to me. And she was instantly delivered of demonic oppression from her Satanism. And I'm like, yay God, right? She says, uh, that's not all. He healed my knees. I'm like, what are you talking about? She says, well, when I grew up, my knees... My kneecaps never grew. They were like the size of quarters, that thin and that small. And because of that, I've been lame all my life. I could never run. That's why I'm so fat. I mean, she, she was way overweight. And she's got these hobbled legs and she goes, and it's a miracle. I could never run with him on the beach before. What am I thinking? Yeah, but that's in your head. You're having a vision. It's not real. And it's as if she could read my mind. She goes, no, he really healed them. Feel them. And I'm like, can I get sued here? <laughs> she, you know, this is an ex-Satanist. Maybe it's a setup, right? We're going to head into, just totally paranoid. But her pastors are there and they go, no, she's telling the truth. And so I gingerly reached out, touched her kneecaps and go, well, those are normal adult kneecaps. She goes, I know. He healed them. I'm like, when? In the last 10 minutes. I'm like, come on. <laughs> You're simply lying. I'm not like Brian, you know, <laughs> Pastor Brian. <laughs> I'm not a word of faith guy. And she, she's telling me her kneecap, bones are growing in 10 minutes. And her pastors are going, this is for real. I'm like, no way. You mean all this stuff about meeting Jesus and listening to him? We're not just making it up? Because I'm not saying I believe any of this. <laughs> I am, this whole sermon, I'm not sure I believe, but I know Jesus believed it. And I can preach anything he believed. And I can give the rest of my lifetime to catching up to him. And so she's saying, I, these, so anyway, I, we parted company. It just blew my mind, right? A year later, I'm back in that city. I'm going, hey, is kneecap girl here? She's like, here I am. <laughs> now, now, this chick, the fact that she'd put up her hand and say there was a miracle, because, because of her knee, lame knees, and therefore her massive overweight, and her severe blindness, and the big Coke bottle glasses, and all that stuff, she had agoraphobia. It was a miracle she was even in a meeting in the first place. She would hide herself in her house. She didn't want anybody to know her. She only got into the Satanism thing for a little bit of empowerment. And, and now she's waving. Can I come share? Agoraphobia girl wants the mic. And I go, come on up. And I, I looked at her, and I completely didn't recognize her. I'm, what happened to you? And she said, uh, after that vision, I started really running with Jesus. I lost 80 pounds this year. I'm like, no way. And she said, uh, and I'm not afraid of being seen anymore. Last Sunday, I sang a solo in church from the front for the first time. I'm like, yes. And then she said this, get a load of, this is beautiful. She goes, look it. I'm like, oh. What happened? She goes, no glasses. I'm like, did you get laser eye surgery? <laughs> By now I'm getting it and it's a joke, right? But she, she says, 2020, he healed my eyes. I'm like, how? How? Punchline. I just kept looking at him. Yeah. All right. Based in the new covenant, based in the promises of, you know, of scripture, based in all Jesus taking care of all the conditions, and based in this one testimony of hundreds I could share, could it be that he would speak to you too? I'm just going to pray a little closing prayer as an exercise, then I'll invite Brian up. Let's, let's, uh, let's close our eyes. Of our body, and open the eyes of your heart and understand that the loving face of Jesus is looking at you and you can look back at him. 
If you were to look in his face tonight, and you are, what expression do you see there? If you could look in his eyes, and you can, what are his eyes telling you tonight? You know how eyes can talk. You know they can give you a look. What look does he give you? Lord Jesus, just open the eyes of our heart to see your face, to see the message in your eyes. And Lord, because your word is true, because your covenant is sealed in blood and on the oath of your own name, I call on you and I ask you to answer us this one question. How do you feel about me? Would you give my brothers and sisters a sense of your heart to speak to us? Don't try, just listen. Let the word of the Lord come. God thoughts. couple follow-up questions. Ask him this. Who are you? <laughs> and he'll say, you know, I am your, and he'll fill in the blank. Lord, who are you to me these days? Finally, um, Lord, do you, do you have a promise for me tonight? Would you just speak that promise to my heart? It was probably good news, wasn't it? Well, it wasn't the devil giving you good news. It wasn't the world giving you good news. It wasn't your flesh giving you good news. It doesn't do that. If you heard good news and you say, is that true and it was true, then we're just seeing a demonstration that Jeremiah 33.3 might actually be right. Thank you, Lord. Ryan, come on up.